What a wonderful morning we're having. And if you were here last week, you will know that uh, my message today is going to be a little different. I'm going to do something different, um, uh, something we, we've not done before. And I'm, I'm hoping this is all going to work. We shall find out, won't we? But we're embarking on a, a, a theme of teaching about identity, who we are, who we are in Christ, new creation realities, uh, sonship. But all of those things have a beginning. And today, I want to talk about creation. If God has not created us, if we don't know God as creator, everything falls apart. I need my laptop. Could you pass that to me, Shagan? Thank you. The one thing, the one, one essential thing I left down there. Um, and uh, so today, we're going to do something very different. I'm going to talk about creation, but I'm going to talk about it from, uh, in, in the context of, of the debate of creation and evolution. And I, I want to give you the evidence. So this is going to be about the evidence for creation. And um, I'm asking all of you to pay attention. Uh, the, the young ones, the youth, I, I want you to get your headsets off, get, get out of your devices, listen to me, because this is relevant. Every day you're in the classroom, you're being fed a narrative as if it is the only thing that matters and the only narrative in the world. And I want us to examine that today. So this isn't simply about what the Bible says. This is about the evidence, okay? So I'm going to begin with uh, Psalm 8, verses 3 to 5, that says this, When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you visit him? For you have made him a little lower than the angels, and you have crowned him with glory and honor. So uh, parents, I'm just going to break off now. Parents, if we could have a look and, and ask the youth and anyone who's around, just take the, take the headsets off, take the, come off the devices, okay, and, and listen to me and pay attention. That would be great. So <clears throat> I've got a presentation um, I'm encouraging you to uh, watch this again. I'm encouraging you to share the link. And um, who knows where this will go? Let's see. All right. So I want to speak to you today about creation and evolution, specifically why I'm a creationist and not an evolutionist. Why is this important? Because neo-Darwinian evolution is the linchpin of the whole world view. It's the, it's the foundation for secular humanism. If science can explain the existence of life without God, then everything else we believe becomes futile and pointless. You may respect people for having a faith or having their version of the truth or their religion, but underneath that, if you think and you know that we are not here because of a creative hand, we're here because of evolution, then all of those things ultimately don't matter and we can just build a world on a foundation of evolution rather than creation. Christianity would be exposed as a myth and everyone can make up the rules as they please. And that is what they're doing. And that is why our culture defends evolution so passionately because the, <laughs> the alternative is too scary. The, the other option, it just doesn't bear thinking about. Now, the reason I do not believe in evolution is not simply faith and revelation, but evidence. Having examined the evidence, I conclude it is lacking. Now, I appreciate that's a bold statement to make because we trust the experts. And we trust the experts and what they 
propose as the evidence for evolution. And what they say, they say with incredible knowledge and intelligence. These people are educated, they're clever, they have brilliant minds, far, far more cleverer than what I is. <laughs> but, the, but the question is this, has science disproved the existence of God? No. The problem, firstly, is the definition of science itself. 200, 300 years ago, science was um, the investigation of natural things. But it evolved itself, the definition of science evolved to be the investigation of natural things by natural means only. In other words, the study of science precluded any other option than natural explanations for natural things. Science itself ceased to be an open investigation into the explanation of the natural world and instead became adherence to a particular world view. Anyone who in the least bit questions the secular evolutionary dogma is judged to be unscientific. They are science deniers. Faced with a constant barrage of supposed evidence for evolution from the secular scientific community, the majority of people don't feel adequate. They feel intimidated to argue or dispute what they hear. When questioned, they will say, ah, I leave it to the experts. But the experts are not neutral. They have an agenda. They have a preset world view into which they fit the bits and pieces of their evidence and their narrative. They are not neutral. They are hostile to the possibility of a created universe. In the face of that intimidation, some believers have tried to accommodate evolution alongside creation. In other words, now, now watch out for this. Don't get caught down that rabbit hole. In other words, evolution as the means by which God created the world. And this, sadly, has become increasingly popular in the Christian community. In my view, this is not acceptable and is simply the result of not looking closely enough at the evidence. For secular society, evolution is the alternative to believing in a creator. It's the explanation of why God doesn't exist. And you cannot use the explanation of why God doesn't exist as the explanation for why he does exist. But furthermore, there is no need to, as we shall see. But first, we have to build a little bit of a foundation here. Let's take a look at biology, and especially microbiology, and the construction of the cell. So at this point, we're going to go over to the, the, the presentation, and we're just going to have a look at a few things. Every life form is made up of cells, from single cell organisms right through to the most complex, the human body. A human body contains trillions of cells, all specializing in thousands of different tasks. The human cell is a world within a world, organized into a complex system. Now that is like a simple diagram um, of, you know, the basic bits and bobs in a cell. The reality is, is much more different. Here is a representation of a portion of a cell. It is 
a universe in itself. There are so many components intricately connected to one another at multiple levels. It's a dazzling world within a world. Now, we're probably familiar with the human genome, the double helix molecule. This consists of a sugar phosphate backbone with these cross members. They're called nucleotide bases, consisting of four sugar molecules that go under the references A, C, G, and T. Now, they are the letters of the DNA alphabet and form a language. The actual sugar molecules are adenine, cystosin, guanine, and thymine, A, C, G, and T. Now, every one of those cross members is made of pairs of these four molecules. I'm giving you a, a, a simplified explanation here. There are 3.2 billion, I said billion, not million, 3.2 billion nucleotide pairs in the human DNA molecule. Think about that. That DNA molecule wrapped up in every single cell of your body is 3.2 billion members long. What is the DNA molecule? It is a book. It's an instruction manual written in a genetic language describing every detail of your being, right down to the color of your eyes, the pigmentation of your skin, whether your hair is straight or curly. Everything about you is specified in detail in your DNA molecule. And each of the trillions of cells in your body contains a copy of the same set of instructions. Amazing, isn't it? Now, computer language has two letters, binary language of computers. The English language has 26 letters. DNA language has four, A-C-T-G. But it is an alphabet nonetheless. And these letters are arranged with precision to determine every detail about you. Now, I just want to say in passing, there is no explanation for the existence of language apart from intelligence. When you see a script like an ancient Egyptian hieroglyphic or when they discovered the Rosetta Stone or when you come across a book in another tongue, you know that that's not random shapes. You know that that is a functionally specific arrangement of alphabetical letters that have meaning. That is exactly the same with your DNA molecule. Four letters arranged precisely as an instruction manual for everything in your body. Now, the functioning parts of the cell are proteins. In fact, the cell is a protein factory. Proteins are molecules that fulfill many different tasks within the cell. They're made up of amino acids, of which there are 20. Let's have a look here. So here's a diagram of the 20 amino acid molecules that are like the sort of, if you imagine when you get um, a Lego set, you know, for Christmas, imagine there's 20 categories of Lego bricks. Of course, there are, there are thousands, many thousands, but let's imagine there are 20. You could put those 
different 20 together in different ways to form a, a multitude of different models. Now, amino acids are exactly the same. They are naturally occurring complex molecules, and 20 of them make up every protein in the cells. So the cell is a protein factory. And this takes place through a complex mechanism called transcription. The amino acids are combined together according to the DNA instruction manual to form a vast array of proteins. In other words, an instruction manual with four letters specifies building blocks with 20 parts and there are thousands of different proteins in the cell and millions of individual proteins. Amazing. Here is another diagram showing on the top left the 20 amino acid molecules. They form together in a chain. And that chain is very long. And it, it, it all clusters together, bottom left, into the pr particular protein. And then a, a complex, amazing thing goes on that's called protein folding. The, the protein molecule literally folds together like the two halves of a clamshell. And when that happens, it becomes a fully functioning um, device within the cell. And um, you can see on the bottom right hand a representation of that, uh, helixes and, and ribbon, helix and ribbon. So all the uh, protein molecules have this kind of appearance, and they are extremely complex, and they are just the, the building blocks of the cell and everything that it does. Right. That's a little snapshot on, uh, you know, microbiology and how the cell is constructed. Now, let's face it. The experts are very clever and very knowledgeable. They speak with supreme confidence. But when you look beyond the bluster, there are many things that simply don't stack up so easily. And I want to give you two examples and I'm going to quote from pop, the books of popular secular scientists, household names, and I'm going to show you two examples of the way that these guys present their material to intimidate the likes of you and me into silence. They try and bedazzle you. Smoke and mirrors. Okay? I hope you're still with me. All right. Okay, this is interesting. The first one, Stephen Hawkins. Brief answers to the big questions. And one of those is, is there a God? Now, you've got to, you've got to understand, I, I'm just summarizing a little bit. And I have no problem with you reading this. I read books like this, and they're interesting. But I want to show you what they do with, a, with your mind, Okay? And, and, to, and, and, and to explain, you don't have to be intimidated by their cleverness and by their knowledge. But listen to the ultimate, you know, where, where um, Stephen Hawkins goes with his argument. He says this, <clears throat> Just as with modern day black holes floating around in space, the laws of nature dictate something quite extraordinary. They tell us that here too, time itself must come to a stop because a black hole has so much gravity, it, it, brings every, it sucks everything into itself. And in a black hole, every, time slows down until ultimately time itself stops. You can't get to a time before the Big Bang because there was no time before the Big Bang. Fair enough. We have finally found something that doesn't have a cause because there was no time for a cause to exist in. For me, this means there's no possibility of a creator 
because there is no time for a creator to have existed in. But immediately, he's put God in a box. He's not, what he's done is, is in his mind, he's created a God after his own image. He said, our examination of the universe and black holes tells us that at the point of the Big Bang, when matter was concentrated into this tiny, tiny um, dot, and there was no such thing as time, therefore God can't exist. Because he cannot understand that if God is God, he exists outside of time. That's the whole point. He's God. <laughs> the idea, his idea of God, limits God to time. But God wouldn't be God if he didn't exist outside of time. God doesn't exist in time. He's above and beyond it. So he's created a God in his own image. But then the, 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 the sad thing is, then they present that as science. Speculation. They present speculation as science. People want answers to big questions like why we're here. They don't expect the answers to be easy, so they're prepared to struggle a bit. When people ask me if a God created the universe, I tell them that the question itself makes no sense. Time didn't exist before the Big Bang, so there is no time for God to make the universe in. Doesn't even make sense. It's an illogical statement. Because his God, his idea of God, depends on time, but time is a creation. By a creator God who created time, like he created everything else. Do you see, do you see how they, they like to kind of bedazzle you? The next one, Richard Dawkins. Ah, here we go. One of his books, The Greatest Show on Earth. Again, I want to show you how they try and play tricks. Now, you wouldn't, unless you'd had your little biology lesson, you wouldn't appreciate even the logic of what he's trying to bedazzle you with here. He's talking about genetic mutation, which we'll come to. And he's trying to show us that the way dogs and cows and cats and animals can be bred to bring out certain traits and characteristics is a proof of Darwinian evolution. Listen to what he says, but listen carefully. What lessons do we learn from the domestication of the dog? First, the great variety among breeds of dogs, from Great Danes to Yorkies, Scottish to Airedales, from Ridgebacks to Dachshunds, from Whippets to St. Bernards, demonstrates how easy it is for the non-random selection of genes. In other words, selective breeding, the carving and whittling of gene pools to produce truly dramatic changes in anatomy and behavior. Absolutely fine. No problem with that. And so fast. Surprisingly few genes may be involved, yet the changes are so large, the differences between breeds so dramatic. Pause. Yes. All that's happened in the domestic breeding of dogs, cats, cattle, is the rearrangement of the existing gene pool. Now think, now listen to me carefully. The 3.2 million, sorry, billion nucleotide bases that specify everything about, they, they can, by breeding, be selected to draw certain traits out. But whether it's a poodle or a dachshund or a great Dane or Sir Bernard, it's a dog. It's a dog. A dog is a dog, and a cat is a cat. But no, now notice the trick that Richard Dawkins plays, the sleight of hand, mid-sentence. Oh, my gosh. Here we go. A dash. The difference between breeds so dramatic that you might expect their evolution to take millions of years instead of just a matter of centuries. If so much evolutionary change can be achieved in just a few centuries or decades, just think what might be achieved in tens or hundreds of millions of years. And the uninformed go, oh, yeah, of course. But my friend, to, to, to evolve from a dog to a whale or a rhinoceros or a buffalo is 
a different species, and that requires the addition of genetic material. Not the rearrangement of the Scrabble letters in the bag. You've got to find new genetic material to create a new species. That is the complete difference. That's the lie that he's, he stitched that in one sentence. And this is so disingenuous because he knows what he's done. There, it's, it's simply no comparison, you know, breeding out characteristics in a dog to creating a new species which requires masses and masses of new genetic material. And it comes down to the basic question that you have to ask the scientists is, where did the information come from? <coughs> where did it come from? Who put the language and the information contained in that language into you. Who wrote the book of your body? Who wrote that? So, don't be bedazzled. Amen? Right, here we go. That, that's my introduction. <laughs> now, we come down to the meat. I am going to give you four. Only four. I'm, I'm going to be kind on the evolutionists. I'm only going to give you four out of many reasons that we could present why the evidence is for creation, intelligent design rather than random evolution. Are you ready? Okay, number one. First of all, we have to understand uh, the primary axiom of evolution. This is important. This is the, the backbone of evolution, the, the explanation. Complex life forms developed from simpler life forms over many millions of years as a result of two things. Random molecular mutation working together with natural selection. Now, Darwin only had one of those. Darwin's thesis was all based on natural selection. They had no idea about the way life was constructed. Not a clue. It wasn't until the 1950s when the, the, the human genome was, was discovered and we understood what, how the, the DNA molecule was formed. And, but until that time, it was just natural selection. Then there was this other component. Ah, genetic mutation. So these two things are supposedly work, working together. Random, tiny, mutations in the genome that are beneficial that are then screened out through the process of natural selection to produce more complex organisms over many millions of years. Now, first problem, first case. Genetic mutations are not of themselves beneficial. I want this to sink in. The premise of evolution rests on what is referred to as the primary axiom. An axiom is, is something that is meant to be self-evident, a truth that is meant to be that needs no explanation. That's, that's what an axiom is. For random mutations to ultimately benefit the organism, they must fix or become permanent. Now you think, that they estimate that you need a population of any species of at least 10,000 to, to, to have a, a, a basis of evolving. So one, one mutation in one of those 10,000, whether it be a, an insect or a rabbit or a dog or whatever, takes place, but it has to fix. But a mutation of itself holds no benefit because it's blind. It doesn't see the ultimate goal. It doesn't know. It is a liability, and the organism will reject it. 
even a half-formed adaptation or enhancement is of no benefit to the creature or the organism until it is completely created or developed. Only when every last piece of the jigsaw puzzle is in place will that benefit function for the organism. Until that time, nothing works. All those sequences of genetic mutations are of no benefit until they're all in place and it works. Imagine your car and you just pull out the distributor lead to the spark plugs. Everything's there except one connection. Nothing works. The car doesn't work. It doesn't go at half speed. It doesn't go at any speed. And that's, now, that's just a car. You imagine something as complex as, as, as a human organism. Okay, take, for example, flight. Let's just take one supposed evolutionary step that a creature developed flight. A bird, in order to fly, must have the cardiovascular system, which is very different from a non-flight animal, for flight. It must have the navigation system. It must have the neural networks in its brain and the skill to pilot the aircraft. It has to have the aerodynamics, the skeletomuscular system, the tail, the feet, the beak, the feeding habits, the digestive system, the metabolism, and finally the feathers. All of those are distinct systems that make up the bird. And all of them have to be precisely located, distributed, and functioning together. Only then will the bird fly. But remove just the two flight feathers, and there's no flight. That's what farmers do. I used to do that kind of thing. You pull out the two flight feathers of a bird, it can't fly. That's all it takes for a bird to be a non-functioning bird. You don't get poor flight, you get no flight. All of that gear to no advantage. Evolution depends on benefit. But there is no benefit until the evolution has taken place. It's a conundrum. But there's a greater problem. To evolve an adaptation like flight, not only must there be a gazillion genetic mutations, each and every one must fix permanently and be replicated across the species and be retained through reproduction, generation after generation, until finally the structure is complete and flight is possible across the representation of that species. The problem is not millions of years. Millions of years isn't enough. Evolutionists like to use examples like the deliberate selection of characteristics through breeding to illustrate how creatures might evolve naturally to adapt to their environment, like dogs or cows. Let's look at this. Here's an anglerfish. Gorgeous creature. You can see why God hid them so far below the surface of the water. You know? I mean, if you're, if, you're, if you're swimming off the beach and you meet one of them, you I mean, we're, we're afraid of sharks. I mean, imagine encountering one of these... These wonderful things. But, <laughs> okay, the tiny glowing, uh, it's called an esker, that amazing thing on, on, on top of its, its head. Tiny glowing bacteria called photobacterium take up residence in the anglerfish's esker, a highly variable structure at the end of its fishing rod. In exchange... The bacteria gains protection and nutrients as the fish swims along. It's an example of what's called symbiosis. Two organisms, two things working together for their own benefit. It's an arrangement. How does such a contraption evolve? It won't function unless it's complete. Can you imagine? Well, what use to the anglerfish is a proboscis that goes halfway up its head with nothing on the end of it. There's no benefit. Or three quarters. Or the whole thing without the, without the photobacterium. 
Who, does, the, does the anglerfish whistle to the photobacterium and say, hey, let's cut a deal. You sit on the end of this thing on the top of my head. I'll look after you. You light up my little rod, and then I can go fishing, and we're okay. Sounds like a good deal. Come on, let's do it. How does the weaver bird build its nest? There's another example. These are extraordinary. With its beak, and there are many, many varieties of them. This one, they literally create the structure, and then they climb up through the bottom of it. How does the trapdoor spider function? Who taught it to build a little hole and then to, to mold a little trapdoor, sit in there, wait for its lunch to walk by, and then spring out and bring it back inside? <clears throat> How does the blowhole of a whale evolve? The story of, of evolution is apparently that mammals that were living quite happily on land went back into the sea and evolved from nose and lungs into blowholes, which are so completely different. And that's just the blowhole, you know, let alone every other aspect of, of a seagoing mammal that distinguishes it from a fish. How, how does a whale exist with half a blowhole? Or, you know, a lung and a blowhole? How did that happen? There's no logical explanation. How does an egg evolve? <laughs> okay, number two. There is no explanation for the origin of life. The greatest missing link is not that which lies between the most advanced primate and Homo sapiens. No, it's that which lies between the most complex naturally occurring molecule and the simplest life form, a single cell microbe. So there is an, one of the amino acids, okay? I'm going to try and say it. <laughs> Hydro, zytrophid, optophan. <laughs> Hydro, hydroxytryptophan. Hydroxytryptophan, got there. <laughs> okay, thank you. Hydroxytryptophan. Um, there, there is a, an amino acid, and you've got to jump from that to a, the, the most simple life form, let's say a single cell bacteria, the kind of thing of which there are thousands living quite happily in your gut right now which would have around 250,000 nucleotide bases in its DNA molecule. Now, that's the simplest life form. A quarter of a million, a, a, a book, an instruction manual with a quarter of a million letters in it. And there are so many problems with this. The cell is not a cell unless it has a cell wall or cell membrane. The cell cannot function as a cell unless it has integrity. You can't have the bits and pieces within the cell operating and evolving the membrane. The mem if the membrane exists, the cell will function. But if the membrane doesn't exist, or even, even if it just has a little puncture in it, if it nearly exists, but not quite, it has no possibility of survival. Uh, the ingredients of the cell, without the cell membrane, would cause contamination, dilution, and destruction. To give you a very, very crude example or analogy, imagine cooking without a saucepan. The cell membrane is like the saucepan or the mixing bowl in the kitchen. Have you tried?
cooking a stew on, your, on the surface of your hob? It's impossible. And that's just carrots and leeks and potatoes and gravy. You have to have containment to have function. And this is the problem, and I'm serious when I say it. There is no explanation for the origin of life. Molecules are formed from atoms. At its most basic level, cell proteins are built from amino acid molecules, and these are among the most complex, naturally occurring molecule substances. We could say amino acids are the bricks from which protein house is constructed. The leap from the most complex inorganic molecules to the simplest single cell organism is a chasm too wide to cross. Scientists have no explanation for this leap of life. As someone has rightly put it, the problem is not to explain the survival of the fittest, but the arrival of the fittest. I wish I had time to go into this more. There are some, some great material that describes this. Okay, number three, genetic entropy. What is entropy? Entropy is the natural breakdown of um, any material, anything, not just organic material, but you, know, you go and visit the ruins of a castle. What you're seeing is an example of entropy. Uh, over time, things don't get more complex, they break down. At our home, we have a recycling compost bin. That's an example of entropy. I put the materials in there. After six months, I've got a sludge that I feed the garden with. Entropy, all of the breakdown. I don't lift the lid off and find, to my amazement, a new species has developed in my, 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 my soup. <laughs> I find the colors have gone to a murky gray. The, the, the solids have mashed down to a, a murky sort of soup. Entropy, that's the problem. Let me describe this to you. Evolutionary theory states that complex organisms evolve from simpler organisms through a process of genetic mutation, natural selection. However, the evidence is to the contrary. The human genome is not evolving into something more complex, but breaking down. The problem we actually have is non-beneficial mutations, deleterious mutations. These have an immediate detrimental effect on the organism. In humans, we see this in the array of genetically based diseases and conditions. The human genome is slowly but surely breaking down. It's suffering from entropy. Let me give you a small example of genetic diseases to demonstrate the enormity of the problem. We have cystic fibrosis, Down syndrome, Charcot-Marie tooth disease, congenital adrenal hyperplasia, Ankylosing spondylitis, albinism, fragile X syndrome, muscular dystrophy, Huntington's disease, hemophilia, sickle cell disease, Turner syndrome, Marfan syndrome, neurofibromatosis. I got that one right. But th th that's the reality. We are not watching the development of beneficial mutations to make the human genome stronger. Science and medicine are throwing all their resources at combating the reality of the real problem, which is non-beneficial mutation. It's genetic mutation is a reality, but it's a major problem, not even a minor benefit. But there are two further problems with this. First, the problem we have already looked at, the beneficial mutation is of no benefit on its own. Secondly, there, suppose there were a beneficial genetic mutation, it would be swamped by the noise of the detrimental genetic mutations and unable to exert itself on the development of the or organism. And that can be observed. Final one. What is called irreducible complexity? 
irreducible complexity is the observation that every individual component of an organism is part of a complex system, and there are many complex systems making up the whole. None of these components can exist on their own or have any use on their own only as part of the complex system. Furthermore, that system only works when every component is present and fit for purpose. To evolve into the architecture would be impossible. Let's take the human eye or the human visual system as an example. Um, just remove me off the screen. Now, it's difficult to see this diagram, but this is the architecture of the visual human system. You have the complete visual system consisting of the eye, the optic nerve system, the visual processing system, um, the eye management system, and the tear system. All of those are subsystems. Each one of those has further subsystems. But we're going to follow just one trail, okay, right down to one particular uh, set of amino acids. We're going to take the eye, then we're going to take the retina. The retina, you can see, is, consists of all those different subsystems. And then we're going to take the, uh, the retinal layer, which breaks down into the rod and the cone cells. Let's take the rod cells. That breaks down into the outer segment, into the membrane discs. And finally, we get right down into the architecture to a, a complex protein called rhodopsin. And rhodopsin is the visual pigment molecule found in the rod photoreceptor cells of the retina. It's amazing. It is what converts light into chemical energy or part of the system that makes our brain understand what light is because light has to be translated into something that our brain can interpret and comprehend. And, the, and the, uh, rhodopsin is the first stage in that process. It's, it's responsible for converting photons into chemical signals that stimulate biological processes in the nervous systems of humans and other vertebrate animals, allowing them, allowing us to sense light. Oh my gosh. Now that's just the architecture of one organ in your body, the eye. One protein, rhodopsin, and there at the bottom are the 20 amino acids that combine together to make that complex protein molecule into what it is and to make it function. Now there it is represented. There's the rhodopsin protein joined to its retinal protein sitting in the rod cell of which there are I don't know, gazillions of them making up the retina. And, and, and those, those proteins all the way along the rod and cone receptor cells of your retina interpreting everything you're seeing. Even as you look at that image, they are busy at work, unbeknown to you, converting light into chemical, uh, chemical signals into neuron stimulus that goes to your brain and says, oh, I'm looking at a screen. <laughs> it's, it's amazing, isn't it? Absolutely amazing. And there is the rhodopsin sitting in the rod and cone retina protein cell. Wow. I have uh, given you a little bit of an oversight, an overview of how you and I are made. Some of the facts and realities. I, I want to recommend to you for further reading, and you, you, I'm happy to, for anybody to speak to me. Here's a great book to start with. Douglas Axe, Undeniable. Really, really good book. Great introduction, and he references lots of others. And here's a really interesting one. Dr. J.C. Sanford, who was 
um, a crop geneticist. And he looks just at the thing we looked at briefly, genetic entropy, and he goes into the whole uh, problematic um, look at, at, at the evolutionary theory of, of uh, genetic mutation as someone who studied and worked in that field for many years. Um, both of them are Christians, creationists, and scientists. And there are many, many books like that. And I, and I encourage you to read further. Now, how are we going to finish today? Got one scripture for you. Um, Psalm 139. Now, I, I know we've, we've gone over a little bit, but it was worth it. I hope you think it was worth it. And um, I, w- I want to read the scripture because I want the worship team to come back up and we're, we're going to have a, a final song where we give praise to our creator. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> I hope this has kind of put some meat on the bones, you know, of what we believe. But Psalm 139, listen to this. <clears throat> Verse 13. You formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, and in your book, (laughs) the book of life, They are all were written, the days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. How precious are your thoughts to me, O God. How great is the sum of them. You are fearfully and wonderfully made by the hands of a loving creator. I want you to be confident in that. Yes, ultimately, it is a question of believing it. But our belief is based on good science, intelligence, an intelligent designer, an intelligent, wonderful, mighty creator. I want you to stand in the presence of our God. And listen, the God who made you can heal you. The God who made your body knows what it needs. And as we finish, we're going to make an altar call for anybody who needs healing, you're welcome to come. We'll pray for you. And the prayer of, pr- prayer of faith will heal you. So ministry team, please come. I'm going to hand over to the worship team. I know you have to c- collect your children. If you need to go, we release you. But if you can stay for prayer and just to give praise to God, our creator, then you're welcome to do that. Hallelujah. Thank you, worship team. And uh, you're welcome to come and we will pray for you if you need healing. Amen. Thank you for watching. Subscribe to our YouTube channel for more ministry from LifeSpring.